began a new series last week. Uh, looking at life in Joseph. And what we did was we read all the way through uh, Genesis chapter 37. And in Genesis chapter 37, we were introduced to Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob. He was the 11 of the 12 sons that Jacob had. And what we saw was that he was Jacob's favorite. His father had no problem showing that uh, he was the favorite in front of all the other brothers. He even gave him his multicolored coat. I let him know he was the favorite. And one of the reasons he was the favorite to be the first one child is his love by his favorite. And so what's interesting was we see Joseph uh, in Rick 37. He would go out to the field and, and, and see the bad stuff that his brothers were doing and report back to his dad. And so because he was the favorite, because he would go in and, and tell uh, his dad the stuff that his brothers were doing, his brothers hated him. It said that Abraham had also said in Genesis 37 last week that Abraham didn't have a kind of word to say to him. And so as the time goes on, Joseph is 17 years old. And what happens is the father said, Dad, let's go check and go check his brother right now. She's in his room on to go check on him. So he goes to check and go check on him. And when he gets there, he doesn't find him. He asks the guy that he runs into him and says, Hey, see my brother? He said, Oh, yeah, I heard that left here in this little town. So he has to get up to town and go catch up to him. And as he's on the way to where the brothers are, they see him coming. And so they have a meeting. And they decide, we're going to kill him. I mean, that's their family problem, right? He said, oh, he said let's, let's kill him. He said, God, you tell us when he's coming, let's kill him. So I'm sitting there trying to figure out how we're going to kill him, take him, he can take the coat off of him, put the blood on him, put the blood on him, so it's your man, and say, oh, man, somebody, I'm going to kill him. So they run this whole plot, and one of the brothers, Ruben, said, hey, man, let's get not kill him. Instead, let's just put him in this empty cistern, and he's just starving to death. We don't have to get blood on him. And he's still in that way, and makes the best, right? Good. So somehow they agree. And what Ruben's thought is, like, okay, everybody needs oxygen, and you get my brothers up to God, make sure we get back. And then what happens is, at some point, Ruben's not with them, and they end up deciding, and they put him in the cistern and say, you know what? We're going to sell them. See, there's a caravan coming and a slave trader. We're going to sell them into slavery and get rid of them back. And so that's what they do. Ruby comes back later, finds out that Joseph's not there. He rips his clothes because that's kind of what they do when they get mad instead of just yelling or something. So he finds out that he's not there. He's sold into slavery. And when we last saw him uh, in the end of chapter 7, we said was he was sold into slavery. In Egypt's Potiphar, it's just Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards. And so before we jump into chapter 39 today, we're going to chapter 39 today. Before we jump into chapter 39 today, uh, there's something that, that we see here, even at the end of the chapter, even with everything that's been done wrong in him, I think food is a pain to us. See, part of the reason we're studying this and looking at his story is looking at what are the principles, what are some lessons and nuggets that we can learn from his life and apply our lives. Okay? And so, there's something we see here that I think is fascinating. So it says, again, so, so partial scroll alert, we don't know what's the word goes, I'll tell everyone. Okay. Uh, things that don't work out in the end of Joseph's mission. I just said that, okay? Things that don't work out. Okay. I was like, I can't read it, don't work out in But, uh, for things to work out for him, there are two pivotal things that have to happen to Joseph. Two pivotal things. One is he needs to end up with Egypt. And the second is, he needs to be close to Pharaoh. Okay? Just to take that. He needs to get up with Egypt, and he needs to be close to Pharaoh. And what we saw in that very last verse was that he sold the Potiphar and said that Potiphar was in Egypt, and he was an officer of Pharaoh. He was like a captain of the guards. And that reminded me of two things I want to share with you before we kind of need to come back to the word today. The first one is this. Sometimes trouble ends up being the transportation to use to carry us to our destiny. Think about that for a second. He got into trouble not because he didn't think of Actually, because he complied against him, right? His own brother, 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 his That's a whole other story. But the, the, within his family, the dysfunction and everything else, he faced trouble, and that very trouble ended up being the thing that carried him towards his death. And what's interesting was while he was going on, he had something that was happening. 
He didn't realize the trophy was pushing him toward the fear God was saying. First thing. The second thing is, the scripture that you can turn to with me real quick is uh, in John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. It's kind of a familiar scripture. And I'll read it here from the New Living Translation. You can follow along with the New King James Version. This is Jesus speaking here. And I bring this up because, again, as we're trying to carry this back to our own lives, I think it's important for us to be able to have some context here. So Jesus is speaking, and this is the thing that Jesus said right here in verse 33. He says, I told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Some translations say trouble, some say tribulation, right? He says, but, but take heart, or some translations say, but have courage, because I have an overcome the world. So what is he saying? Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. Everybody say trouble. Who oh. said say trouble? Uh-huh. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. So I'm not talking about Barbara, but like I said, I guarantee it, right? Oh, that's wrong. Everybody else is like, dude, what? He said, I'm promising you, you're going to face trouble. What we see in those who face here is trouble. It is tribulation, it's trial, it's sorrow. He said, you're going to experience that on this journey called life, and that's exactly what we see Joseph facing uh, in this story. And so he promises us that, and then he also tells us to have courage in face of these things. He said, have courage in face of these things because despite what you go through, you have peace in me. You have peace in me. So sometimes it might be difficult to have peace in me. I want you to, to, to continue to go through. And, and here's the thing I want to make. Just a couple of point here. Uh, some people will look at this and say, I guess, uh, God's not an author of the trouble that we face. I say that. I say. God's not an author of the trouble that we face. And I know this could be a different concept of the correct side, right? Because here's a question that, that I've heard people ask hundreds of times. They say, well, if God is all known, Pastor, then, then why does he allow these trials to come up with trouble and suffering that? Right? Why, why, why does he allow this to happen again? Uh, and if I tell you that, hey, because he's following the world, he doesn't play the things with this. But one thing that I want you to see from Joseph's story is this. Although God doesn't call us a little closer to faith, right? God's not the author of Jesus, he's not the author of all of those things. He uses the Joseph's benefit. Right? He uses the Joseph's benefit, and similarly, I think God will use. What we go through, even when there's storms and sorrow that we experience for our good. That somehow good can be worked from the things that we experience. And I know that sounds all, all, all great and good, and I'll show you uh, some scripture on that here, here in a moment. But I want us to start there at the starting point, and then we're going to not turn off the next Genesis 39, because we're going to look at this particular storm and trial and trouble that Joseph is going to face. This period of life. So I'll be back to Genesis at the very beginning, uh, Genesis chapter 39, and we're going to read starting at verse 1. Genesis 39, starting at verse 1. So Genesis 39, starting at verse 1. Uh, I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation again. Follow along with whatever translation you have in front of you, you can get to the same place. And I'm going to start reading kind of the first six verses here. Two. So this is what it says. It, it starts kind of where it left off on the last, uh, on the last part of the story. So verse one. It says, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was the captain of the guard, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Jewish master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar's first order. So he soon made Joseph his personal team. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. And then, verse 6, 
Verse 6 says, this says, Potiphar said, Potiphar said, Potiphar gave him Joseph, who uh, cannot see his dream, <laughs> uh, complete administration and responsibility over everything he owned. Uh, with Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. And then this last part he wrote in, it's kind of the next part of the story, I'm going to read that in a second. He said, Joseph was very handsome, uh, and well built, and well built, and it sounded like some over. He was very handsome. When you look at this passage, there's a word that jumps out to me, and the word is paradox. The word is paradox. My favorite definition of the word paradox is this. Paradox is two contradictory statements held together by the greater truth. Two contradictory statements held together by the greater truth. I'm going to give you an example to what I mean. Uh, if we saw a high school senior, and we met at the beginning of the senior year, and we told us, hey, this is the beginning of the end. So when you say the end, the end, those seem to be opposites and contradict one another, right? But we understand that not only is the beginning of your senior year, but it's also the end of your last year. So we understand those two things which seem to be opposite can exist together. But when we look at this scripture, I'll give this scripture in then uh, paradox. Say, why? Because for me to tell me that the dude got sold into slavery, that he's dealing with all the difficulty, and it also said the Lord is with Do what? The, the Lord is, is, is with him. Uh, let's only read verses 1 and 2 one more time. Uh, just for emphasis. Verse 1. It said that Joseph was taken to Egypt by Israelite traders. Again, so first talk about him, and uh, an officer, probably was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh's king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. So again, so by your brothers, any of the slavery in the suits, I was named by the time. My first thought when I looked at this is like, if the Lord was with Joseph at 17, why don't the brothers hate me? Why did they sell me away if the Lord was with me? Like, I, I'm, I'm just saying, why would I go work with this guy? The question we might have is, wait, hey, if the Lord is with us, why do we experience trials and troubles the way Jesus already told us that in this life we're going to ask him? Right? Paradox. These competing things that don't seem to make sense until we live it out. Where you experience, hey, God's been good. This has been one of the hardest things I've ever experienced in my life. This, 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 you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Check uh, uh, when, I, when I read this passage, uh, the, the, the thought we might have is that, okay, we think that having the Lord with us will move us from everything, right? We'll move us from having trouble, we'll move us from having trouble. But it seems that we can succeed uh, in the face of storms, in the face of trouble, because we have the Lord with us. And then it reminded me immediately of this other verse. So I want to show you one more scripture. Let's go to um, Psalms uh, 37. I'll wait for this. Psalm 37, uh, verse 23. Because when I thought about this idea of, of God being with us, uh, there's a scripture here that just, ah, the 23 and 24. So Psalms 37 and 23 and 24. Uh, again, I'm, I'm reading the New Testament translation. Psalm 37 and verse 23 and 24. The media are experiencing. It says, The Lord directs the steps of the God. He delights in every detail of their lives. It says, Though oh, they stumble, they will never fall. The Lord holds them by his hand. Nobody just wants to get off the back of the part they got to themselves. So, the first part, right? The Lord directs us to the God. Let's look at them. Like, like Proverbs 16, right? The Lord directs our sin. We get that part. But the fact that he can delight in the detail of our lives is a challenge to him. Is he so slavery? Right? He broke the man in the city every night. Like, hey, like, hey, it's not a challenge, right? But like, I mean, it, it is a struggle when I see this. And what I wonder is uh, a couple things. One, how did God take the light and everything to tell my story when I'm 
There are some parts of my story that I don't want to speak to again. I did not even have to ask that. I didn't. The second part is what I wonder is, does God take the land in every detail because in spite of the situation we face, God is going to work through it. It's almost like I heard someone say, you know, that um, to get a happy ending, you've got to have a uh, hellacious or a bumpy middle. <laughs> you know, you've got to have a good ability to happen in the middle before you get to the end. So can you delight in the details of the middle because that's what makes the end so much bigger. Let's go one more verse. Let's go to Romans 8.28. This, this is a good old, uh, good, good favorite church verse here. Romans 8, 28, New King James. If you've been in church for a while, when you grew up, uh, the, the real Baptist, uh, <laughs> like we used to be one of those, they get shouting this. It says this, it says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to the church, right? The real famous <laughs> quote of scripture, right? We know this, right? All things, right? Work together for the good of those who love God and who call them according to a purpose. And again, the thing that we all just have to realize is so, so I grew up in, in, in a context where when they said this verse, it's something good that already happened. You know? They said, like, hey, man, I'm fine, I got a job. Man, we know all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, right? I mean, we can say it then, but what I realized if it's true that all things work together, then when I got to say it all, that means all things work together. <laughs> when they repossess my car, all things, you know, maybe my payments didn't work together for the new numbers, right? <laughs> Stay focused. Right? That, that it is true, all things are working together for our good, then even when it doesn't feel good, we have to believe that it's working together for our good. Even when it hurts, it talks about sorrow, when he said in 1633, that when we find moments of sorrow and hurt and difficulty, that even though I don't understand why this happened, but I know somehow some good has come from this, not because of me, but because it's the promise of my scripture. Now, I can't believe uh, what that would have not been done when we're having a difficult season. Because I believe that we can see Joseph and say that the Lord was with him, and that means that, okay, at this point of the story, Joseph probably could have made, maybe you could see uh, or really understand how God could be completely position because everything doesn't work out. And what I wonder is, if you can see that on Joseph, this is turning it on you. Are you, do you find yourself in the middle of your story right now wondering, like, God, how can good come out of this? How can I be assured that you're with me? Because what I'm going through feels overwhelming. Maybe it feels like you're a man. Maybe it feels like, ah, I don't know if this is going to work out. And all I know to do is to hang on and trust God that somehow it's going to work out. And I want to encourage you to do that. To hang on and to trust because it's easy if you go back to the end of the story to the people who say this and those who be like, oh, okay, this is it. At this point, he thinks this is it. Like, I'm just going to be a slave here in this house. And it's cool to say, oh, man, we have a very hard to make a man in this house. I can't, I'm not free to go. Do you understand? In, in the context, it, 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 it seems good to say, the Lord, we're going to go out still. If my mind is not like, God, we're going to go out still. We should keep you out here. I don't know if I'm making it, but can I get one of them? Maybe a test card, or like a Jeep Grand Cherokee, you know, these people, or something like that. Can they help me to leave? And so saying that the Lord is with me, when I'm in the middle of the story, when it doesn't look like it, we have to trust that, that, that even when it doesn't look like it, it doesn't feel like it, that God isn't with us and He's leading us. If He's delighted in every detail of our life, then don't give up before the story goes. Amen. Don't quit because you're just sitting here going like, I don't know how this is going to work out. Maybe I should just, uh, do they tell um, Joseph the first guy is out? No. There's another part here. Just, um, stop. When we look at, uh, go back to verse 2 from God. So I'm going back to this. Alright, I'm jumping around and trying to show you this. I'm going to go back to Genesis 2 because there's something here that I want. Again, in 
this is too, he says, we won't do the building. So he succeeded in everything he did as a servant in the home of this Egyptian master. The Lord was with Joseph, and so he was able to serve uh, all the time. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, the point is this, when you see in verse 2, we see Joseph, uh, it says that the Lord was with him, and we recognize that Joseph didn't walk around and do the title. He didn't walk around like, like some uh, privileged, spooky jerk. Because he said, uh, you know, God's going to clean up all of my messiness and my unfaithfulness. Right? <laughs> you, you know, right? He didn't say to the God, I'm not walk around like the Lord's with me, so I'm happy. Oh, man. Okay. Right? Yeah. The Lord was with Joseph. So he was able to serve him with excellence. Even though he faced a difficult circumstance. He served with excellence. It says in verse, it says, he served in home. It said that he served in home. So he served in excellence. Even though they weren't afraid. Even though they said that they died in a certain place, he still served with excellence. And so here's the question. You know, if the Lord is with you, are you serving with excellence in spite of the circumstances you're facing? Yeah, the only one in that place, right? 
And it's interesting, he served with the level of faithfulness that he was rewarded if he kept being promoted. I'm just saying. With a level of integrity that made others take notice. And he didn't do it for that reason.
When she saw that she was holding this cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband brought this Hebrew slave here to make fool of us. He came into my room to rape me when I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind, excuse me, behind the window. She kept the cloak until her husband came home, and then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave who brought us to our house tried to come in and fool around with me, and she said, but when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving the cloak with me. Verse 19. Papa was curious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into a prison where the prisoners were king's prisoners for help. And there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison workers. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more words until Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Again, paradox. Lord was with him to be in jail. Oh, God. But I think about Thomas and Thomas of the Bible. I think it's, I find it so interesting here that when things are going pretty good. It seems like temptation and opposition often comes along and try to knock you off the wall, right? I love the fact uh, Andre actually switched up. You go back to verse number 8 and 9 real quick before we start. We're going to read it one time. Verse 8 and 9. What I love about verse 8 and 9 is that being confused, but those are confused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in this entire household. He said, no one here has more authority than I do to tell back nothing to me except you because it's life. And how can I do such a wicked thing? And you would think you would say, how can I do this against my master? But what he says is, it would be a great sin against God. It would be a great sin against God. And I love that he doesn't get a very good father, but he speaks with accountability to God. He speaks with accountability to God. And that's what he really works for. Right? Uh, oh, 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 baby. I was going to point that. Can you pull up a verse for me? I'm making a good one for that here today. What was Colossians 3.25? What was Colossians 3.25? Oh, sorry, 3.23. 3.23. Just a few. Colossians 3.23. Can you pull up a verse for me? 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 Can you pull it says, work literally at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than the people. So I don't know who signed your check. I don't know if you want to get ready to check it or your body's coming in now, right? But we work for the Lord. We're held accountable to God for how we operate and how we do what we do. Right? That, that, that's that's who we're responsible for, Lord. That, that's who we have to work for. And I look at those and I'm like, man, this guy. He's like, I'm not necessarily worried about my life, but I can't do this against God. I can't do this against God. You know what I'm saying? the point, yes, right? I said it. Uh, here's the point. I said all this from the point of this. When temptation comes, you're ready to come your destiny. Stay focused on what you're supposed to do. When, when, when something comes to try to get you off track, they both know what you're supposed to do. Right now, could be pushing you close to your destiny. 
us. I think about the end of the story that was going to happen. In this moment where this lady lies on him, he's like, I didn't do it. They just throw him, you know, no pass, no, we're going to break him. We're going to lock him up. It probably didn't feel like, oh, I'm on my way to the past, probably do. It feels like, what did I do? And maybe you feel like that. Maybe right now, in this moment, you feel like, God, what, what do I do to serve this? God, what am I doing with all these crazy people? God, why am I in this situation right now? And I hope by looking at Jordan, that Joseph's story, that you remember that if you find yourself in a situation where uh, 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 you're dealing with adversity, you're dealing with difficulty, you're dealing with challenges, you're dealing with not being treated fairly, or even being falsely accused of something you did not do, I want you to look at the opposition that's coming against you. Look at the circumstances that are trying to get you off course, and remember that if you are a follower of God, that's what you Scripture tells us repeatedly that God's not going to leave you in hope And I know that sounds really in the sense too, right? That's like something that you say, but I want you to take off those pages and you have to be able to believe that it's the truth of your life. We have to walk in the confidence that God is with us, even though, like you read, some circumstances might not be with us, and the end is all going to end up with us. Don't let the difficulties, don't let uh, uh, some of the cause you to quit and give up. I'm convinced that the enemy cannot stop you, but he tries to get you to stop yourself. Tries to get you to quit. Tries to get you to just let go. But who do you keep with you? But who do you keep going? I keep working to the fact that God is with us, right? Because that's the scripture that says, I can leave you with the same But now I'll kind of put that on the other side. Because if you're someone here and you say, well, well Pastor, I, how do God is with you? Right? If you can't say that with surety that God is with you, then what I wonder is, what are you, what are you counting on me? Like, really, and I say this not in like a, a, a judgy way or a negative way, but it's seriously, where, where is your hope that things going to work out? So, so I can talk about me, I can't talk about God. I can't trust me. Maybe. You know, I'm like, hell, yeah, I don't know what this is. This might not be the one, you know, it's not going to work out, right? Like, like I, I don't know if I can trust me. And when I face situations that are bigger for me, if my hope is in bigger in myself, after a Degrees or in my intelligence or the people I know, that's not good enough. He had God, and that's what got to overcome all of these situations. And we have to have God help us overcome everything that's wrong with us. I don't know if more twists and turns to the story is we need to walk in that thing from the beginning, but as a stopping point, and I guess we were starting from here today, is Really asking you that question, do you have God with you? Do you know that you know that I have God with you? Because if you don't know that you have God with you, then you can do all the right things and still live your life not right. You can achieve all the world's most success in the world and still feel it when it's not right. You can go on this journey and feel like you're fighting a losing battle because there's uh, something that's not on the other side. As you continue to take this journey on life, you don't have to go, and you're hitting this thing, you're achieving these things, you might get pressed for people, but you know, there's something missing. That's why I give you an opportunity to make those decisions. If you're here, you never made Jesus in your life. Here's what we believe in. We believe that Jesus really did die on the cross, that he really walked this earth, and that when he died on the cross, he gave it as a sacrifice for us. Not because we live in this Because what needs to take place to, to atone for uh, all those things. And so all the bad stuff we would do, right? Not, not just in the past, but our past, present, and future sins. Jesus died on the cross that one time for the world. Hebrews said it was once and for all sacrifices. 
I know that sounds weird for someone who's like, why did God do sin? Yes, all of our sin would be that right. Because we were based on us, and we had to get back on the cross again, which doesn't have to happen. So he died from all of our sins. He said that, okay, very few days, he rose again and sitting in the right hand of the Father. He said, if you place your faith in me, right? If you place your faith in me, that's what gives you access to heaven. That's what gives you the opportunity to do it. That's what you're doing. That's what you're right? You should understand, okay, he died for you, so you have a purpose in the family. You have to trust me to do all this earth bottom system. And the only way I'm going to know is being in a relationship with you. The only way I'm going to understand why you created this. Why did why, you give me these gifts and talents and abilities? Why did you give me an opportunity to use them? Uh, because there was something you had planned for me before you started to start. And if you had to make that decision, you have to make that decision. Well, that's the question. It's not about church. It's not about religion. It's about you. One, settling your future. Also, make a decision to have a relationship with the person you're in. God's not so mystical being out there. He wants to have an intimate, closer relationship with you. So, you have to make that decision. If you and I, the other thing we talk about a lot is social media and this, and all these many ways of God. You have to believe in me. So I'm going to speak to this. The thing is, you have to make that shit right. So we don't stand, we don't stand, we have our prayer house to come down, but you need to be there with us. You can't say, hey, I'm going to die in this video. And I know I'm going to die in God. I'm going to ask you to make that decision. If you make that decision, even if I didn't see you again, I would see you again. But it's a decision that every single one of us has to make for ourselves. The second thing like that is this idea of dedication. Dedication for those who say, well, they pass it on. I've made a decision to play my man with you. I'll give my life with you, but I'm honest with you where I am right now. I don't know if that's true. Maybe there's a positive business. I'm going to make a bad decision to take it. Bro, say all types of stuff. Man, I just feel like it's out here. But the good news is that uh, God has never come and come down to And what he says is, in spite of all that stuff, I still love you. Repent, let's keep going. Too often when we find ourselves in that position, we feel like we're stuck. And we have to do the consequences of our choices and actions. That's cool. It's kind of cool. There's something on the other side of that that we want to spend our life doing. Like, oh man, I, I, I messed up and I can't go uh, beyond this. I'll give you an analogy of a uh, GPS for driving across. It was GPS to say, hey, go for two miles. And when you're driving the car, you can take a quick turn, you can take a huge push. The GPS said, go for two miles. And no matter where you go, the GPS says, if you recalculate based on where you are now, it's still a short course to get you where you need to be. And I think that's what God did. He does with us. So we say, yeah, I love you. Yeah, you can think of myself. And God loves you very, very good. And if with you, Third is the idea of prayer. If you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too small, there's nothing too large. We're a church who believes and knows that prayer works. So don't be in this place saying, man, I need prayer. Uh, I only pray for this is my question. Yeah. Last Sunday, we got this guy's calling to be part of this church. He was preaching to me to go. Whenever he was up there on Sunday, Wednesday, we were practicing all this other stuff. We try to teach the word of God in a simple and uncomplicated way so you can understand it and then go there. Second, we want to go visit our community and we just bought ourselves to become a church community. Third, we are a church friends who can get the story to the background. People are dating to God. She sent us here together to um, come to make a difference and we use to bring our gifts and talents to make it back to this church and beyond these four walls in this community. And so if you're like, man, I love being a part of that, we would love to have you. So there's four things. You need to be saved. You need to be there. You need to be prayer. Anything. God's calling you to be a part of this church. We would love, love to have. So I'm going to ask you to do your favor. Uh, if you are able to, can you stand for me right here in the morning? I'm going to ask my prayer counselor to come back and be in position. And so we're going to sing with these folks. And as we are uh, singing, if you could respond to one of those four things, I'm going to ask you to come down and talk to them tomorrow.
Yeah.